Keep asking you that question I've been asking you for the last few sessions. You know the question, right? Have you picked a company? I'm going to assume at this point. I'm going to assume at this point that you. <coughs> pass out there, you might want to turn the mute on, okay? I'm going to assume at this point, luckily it's not somebody in the room, be glad that they're there, right? So no. I'm going to assume at this point, you've already picked a company. I'm done nagging, right? But here's what I want you to do. Assuming you've picked a company, remember that master spreadsheet I keep sending you? Go in and enter the name of the company. And don't worry about what other people are picking. It's okay to have multiple people valuing the same company. It's not the end of the world. And before I forget, next week, you have no school on Monday. Right? You don't have to say, it's not, I'm not giving you a gift. This is the university is closed. So you have no class on Monday. And on Wednesday, your class will be entirely an online Zoom class. It will not be in this classroom. So... So basically, it'll be a Zoom class. The link is on, you know, it's already there, but I'll send it to you anyway in case you don't have it. But next Wednesday's class, don't show up in this room, or you can if you want. You can bring your laptop and watch the Zoom session here. If you, you're that fond of this room, I'm not, right? So next Wednesday, we will have an entire Zoom class. Right? So we're going to start in today's class. We're going to talk about the cost of debt. If you think about everything we've done so far, it's about getting a cost of equity, risk-free rate, beta, risk premium. And today I'm going to complete that. And we're going to move on to the cost of debt. At one level, it's much simpler. Another level, it's screwed up all the time. So to see how cost of debt gets screwed up at companies, at consulting firms, at banks, I'm going to give you the date on a company. This is a company that has a billion dollars in bank loans that it took a while ago when rates were lower, it was a safer company. These bank loans have an interest rate of 4%. So these are long-term bank loans. You've locked in the 4%. Right now though, the risk-free rate is up to 5%. You can make that T-bond rate. And the risk of this company is such that the default spread you'd have to pay over and above that 5% if you chose to borrow money now is 2%. So I've got everything lined up for you. So here's my question. If I were to use a cost, needed a computer cost of debt, a pre-tax cost of debt, forget about the tax effect, the pre-tax cost of debt in a cost of capital calculation, I want you to tell me which of the numbers I've thrown at you, you would use as your cost of debt. Let's start with the 4%. What am I doing when I use the 4%? 
I'm looking at your actual cost of debt on your books. It's called a book interest rate. About two thirds of DCFs that I see do this. Tell me what's wrong with doing it. There's something so fundamentally wrong that I've done that I've broken a first principle on. What's wrong with telling the world that my pre-tax cost of debt is 4%? Yeah. More debt at the same rate right now. Not even that, right? The risk-free rate is 5%. So you know, even though you can't go out, so you can, I, I, because I, you know what my counter to that is, right? I don't plan to borrow any more money. I'm a mature company. So if your argument is I can't borrow more money at 4%, I have a counter to that. I don't plan to borrow money. I've locked in this debt. But even then, to argue that your cost of debt is 4% when the risk-free rate is 5% makes no sense. In fact, I'll tell you what's going to happen. If you treat your cost of debt as 4%, let's suppose I come to you with an investment. Let's say you have a project that's 100% financial debt. Well, it's almost never going to happen. Let's say you do. If you treat your cost of debt as 4%, the return on the project is four and a half percent. Keeping with the logic, what should you do? You should take the project, right? You see how absurd it is? You can make 5% risk free. Why would you take a project with a four and a half percent return when you can make 5% risk free? So 4% is off the list. Maybe you can say, look, I'm going to floor it at 5%. No, you know, that's uh, you know, it's risk free. But then it's really not a cost of debt. You just use the risk free. I've kind of led you to the answer. The cost of debt pre-tax for this company is 7%. It's a rate at which you can borrow money today, even if you never plan to, because a cost of capital is what I need to make on a business to break even, to kind of given. So think of it from an investment standpoint. You're the investor in the company. You have investment opportunities where you can make 5% risk-free, 7% on, a, on, a, on bonds of equivalent risk. 7% is your cost of debt. You see, what's a five and a half? When people get uncertain, you know what they do? They take two numbers, they average them up. So let's say this is a quiz. Is that 4%? Uh, that's a cost of debt. 7% looks okay too. I feel uncomfortable picking either. Let me split it. Please don't do that. It's getting you the worst possible answer you can get. It's indefensible. There's nothing you can use to argue that that's your cost of debt. But the pre-tax cost of debt per account, I've just made your life incredibly simple. Because let's say you're computing the cost of capital for a company that has tens of loans outstanding, five different bonds outstanding. You know how much time people waste trying to compute a weighted average cost of debt based on what's on the books? Your cost of debt now has nothing to do with what's on your books. It's based on what the risk-free rate is right now and what your default spread or default risk as a company is right now. You're done. What's on the books com becomes completely irrelevant. The pre-tax cost of debt for this company is 7%. It has a billion dollars in bank loans outstanding. Remember to go from cost of debt to cost of capital, I need weights on debt and equity. In this case, let's assume that the market value of my equity is also a billion. And I say, okay, what weights should I use for debt and equity? This looks like a slam dunk, right? How much do they have outstanding as bank loans? One billion, you have a billion in equity. It looks like a 50-50 mix. It can't be that easy. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put this question out. So what am I missing when I tell you that the debt is a billion dollars? Go back to the previous problem. I have a billion dollars in debt. The coupon rate on the debt is 4%. That's what the interest rate is. What's the current market interest rate on that debt? It's 7%. You, you know, when we calculate the market price of a bond, what do we take? We take the coupon, we take the face value, we discount it back at today's market interest rate. You don't have to give me an answer, but if I take the market value of this debt, which is what I should be using in the debt ratio, the book value is a billion. That, I, nobody's arguing with that. But what will the market value of this debt be? First, give me a sense of direction. Will it be less than a billion or more than a billion? It's going to be less because anytime the interest rate rises above the coupon rate for a bond, it trades below par. The estimated market value of this debt might be 900. I don't know exactly what it is. You can work it out with a 7% interest rate. It's like 910 million. So in addition to using that pre-tax cost of debt that reflects what you can borrow today, here's the other thing you need to fix. You can't just use book value of debt. You got to replace it with an estimated market value which might be lower than the book value if interest rates have gone up. 
So that's the principle we're going to draw on when we think about cost of capital is your cost of debt is the rate at which you can borrow money long-term today. And your cost of equity. I'm sorry, and the weights in your will have to reflect the market value of debt and equity today. So we'll talk more about this because today we're going to explore more how you come up with that spread and what the right spread for your company is. So let's go back and look at where I left you off on Monday. We talked about the bottom-up beta, right? The beta for a company being based on the business is your end. I sent you that 10 questions. The reason I sent you those questions is, I promise you this fight when you get to work, wherever you go, if your job involves estimating betas, you're going to have a fight on your hands because there'll be people who there who say, why aren't we using the Bloomberg beta? Why aren't we using a regression beta? Because that's the way most people get taught betas. I want you to be able to address that question and talk logically and intuitively, but here's why you should not trust one regression beta. Did somebody want to help me out here? What are the three fundamental flaws of the single regression beta? First one is, it's noisy. Statistically, you get a range, you don't get a number. Second, it can be manipulated to the extent that the analyst is going and looking at not multiple, and third, it reflects your company as it. Uh, I was going to say it, was back, it, it looks backwards. So. It looks backwards. So you reflect your company as is. So for Disney, it doesn't reflect the size of the streaming business. If you're at and it doesn't reflect the fact that you've divested yourself of some businesses. It's noisy. It's backward looking. It can be manipulated. So what do we do instead? We draw on the law of large numbers. This is not finance theory. This is statistics. We're replacing a single beta with an average of 100 betas. And if you're in multiple business with each one, I replace the regression beta with the weighted average of the betas of business. So now I want to talk about a couple of practical challenges you're going to face in applying this. Now, one of the companies I'm going to estimate a cost of capital for is Embraer in 2004. Embraer is a Brazilian aerospace company. And I mentioned that if you define your comparable companies to get your, your bottom of beta as other Brazilian aerospace companies, you're going to run into a brick wall. So, but I, to estimate Embraer's beta, the unlevered beta that I used was the unlevered beta across aerospace companies globally. Now, whenever I do this, the pushback I get is, you cannot use the betas for, of non-Brazilian companies for a Brazilian company. And my response is, why not? What's the average beta across all Brazilian companies assuming computed betas, right? It's one. What's the average beta across African companies? One. European companies, one. The nice thing about betas is it's scaled around one. I give the example of, let's say I have two rooms of people. First room is filled with NBA. No, Na National Basketball Association players. The second room is filled with jockeys. You say, if I compare the average height, this is going to be a no-brainer. The room full of basketball players is going to be full of tall people. But what if in each room, I took the height of each person and divided by the average height of the people in that room? Then I can talk about relative height, right? Relative height, one room can't be higher than the other or lower than the other because that's basically what a beta is. A beta is a measure of relative risk. I'm not saying that a beta 1.2 in Africa is the same as a beta 1.2 in the US, because I know country risk is great in Africa. The way I capture that is with an equity risk premium. The advantage of going global is my sample size gets huge. But I'll add a warning. This assumes that the business is roughly the same globally. And with aerospace, I have, I'm on pretty solid ground, right? Who does Embraer sell its aircraft to? United, Singapore Airlines, Lufthansa. Who does Boeing sell its aircraft to? United, Singapore Airlines, Lufthansa. You're selling to the same customers. It's a global business. They're affected by the same forces. Airlines have trouble. Everybody feels it. So in this case, global averages make complete sense. You're a mining company. What difference does it make whether you're a Brazilian mining company, an Indian mining company, an American mining company? commodity prices go up and down, you feel exactly the same effects. I'll tell you when you might be a little cautious about going global. If you're producing a good or service, remember we talked about discretionary last week, you know, something on Monday, 
when something, your customers can live without something, they can delay buying it, they can defer buying it, your beta will be higher. There are some businesses where the product or service that's produced is a necessity in some parts of the world, but discretionary in other parts. In the early days of smartphone business, when you looked at telecom companies in developed markets, you got fairly low betas before you adjusted for that. Why? Because in the US and Europe, phone services become something of a necessity. You don't, you know, you, you basically assume that that's something you're going to pay for. In much of the emerging market world, though, you know, a lot of people, you know, in India 10 years ago, most people did not have smartphones, they couldn't afford it. Will, when will they afford it? If India does well, it grows 10% a year. You're going to have more people affording it. In other words, in India, telecom service is more of a discretionary service than it is in the US. You see where this is going, right? You can be an Indian company to value rather than look at all global telecom companies. I might focus only on telecom companies in emerging markets. I still won't say focus in India. It's too small a sample. So if you go to my website, I actually report betas by, by industry. I have 96 industries for global companies, in case you want to do what I did with Embraer. I do it for just US companies. The nice thing about the US companies, the betas to begin with are more reliable because they run against the S&P 500. I also report betas for emerging market companies, which include Asia, Africa, Latin America, just in case you have a, you know, like in the example being the telecom companies. I have betas for European companies. Maybe there's a sector where Europe's regulation is very different. The EU is on its own regulatory pages. It writes regulations on things that the rest of the world might not regulate. But my point is those betas by region are not random. You don't pick whatever you want. Pick it based on the reasoning on your company. And I do it, as I said, for me, not for you, because if I have to value a steel company in India in March of 2022, I'm not building this up from scratch. I just go to my table. I look up the beta for global steel companies and I move on. You know, there's, you know, there's far too much important stuff to do in valuation to end up wasting your time spending days getting the beta for a company. Get the beta from the business, move on. So that's the first point is, when you think about comparable companies, don't think geographically isolated. You want to, you know, you're trying to do a Polish company. If you stay with just Polish companies, you're going to crash and burn. There aren't enough companies in most sectors for you to be able to do that. Here's the other thing that you might run into. All of the debt ratios I talk about are gross debt ratios. You know what I mean, what I mean by gross debt ratios? I take the total debt and I divide back over. So when I computed the beta for Embraer, I used the total debt at Embraer divided by the market value of equity, and I get a debt ratio of 18.95%. That's what I used to get a levered beta of 1.08. But there are parts of the world, big chunks of the world, Europe, Latin America. When people talk about debt ratios, they're talking about net debt ratios. What's net debt ratio? You take the total debt and you subtract out cash. And often there's this huge argument that will go on and you now why are you using net debt ratio? Why is, and I, I, I'll be quite open about this. You can use either as long as you stay consistent. It's going to sound absurd, but let me back this up. The net debt ratio for Embraer is actually minus 3.32%. Already people freak out, right? You say, why is the debt ratio negative? It's very simple. If your cash balance exceeds your total debt, your net debt ratio is going to be negative. Apple has a negative net debt ratio. In fact, every one of the Fangam stocks, maybe other than Netflix, has a negative net debt ratio. This is not unusual. You see it in a lot of firms. Here's the first rule. If you decide to go the net, negative, the net debt ratio route, don't replace the negative with a zero saying negative can't happen. Negative can happen. You've got to let it fly. And if you have a negative net debt to equity ratio, guess what? Your levered beta is actually going to be lower than your unlevered beta. That sounds weird, but basically, with a negative net debt ratio, you end up with the beta that's levered that's actually lower than your unlevered beta. Let's play it through. If you use a lower beta, what happens to your cost of equity? It's going to be lower, right? So you're saying, but I'm getting very different numbers. But remember, the ultimate end game is cost of capital. If I use gross debt ratios like I did, I get a higher cost of equity. When I get to the cost of capital, equity is about 84 point something percent. Debt is about 16 percent. I take a weighted average. And my cost of capital goes down because debt is cheaper than equity. If I go the net debt ratio route, I get a lower cost of equity. You're starting to celebrate, but then you get to the cost of capital. What's the weight on your equity going to look like if you have a negative net debt ratio? 
the weight in equity is actually going to be greater than 100%. Again, it's mind boggling. He said, what the heck is happening? I'm selling short on my own debt. Effectively, you are. You have 102% equity minus 2% debt, which means you get no benefit from debt in your cost of capital. It'll actually pull your cost of capital up when you do your cost. Of and guess what? When you're done, you're going to end up with roughly the same cost of capital of the two approaches. The one approach, you start with a high cost of equity adjusted down. The other, you start with a low cost of equity and adjust up. If you don't believe me, work out the math. Put in an arbitrary cost of debt, see what happens using gross and net debt ratios. So here's the bottom line. If you're working with an analyst who insists that he can use only net debt ratios, he's absolutely rigid about it. So that's okay. But don't let him do things like if it's negative, use zero, which, which is what a lot, of, a lot of people do. Carry it to its logical end. So I think I'm ready to pull everything together on the cost of equity calculation. We've spent four sessions getting here. Might as well pull them all together. Ultimately, in your cost of equity, there are three numbers. There's a risk-free rate. There's a measure of relative risk, beta or some, something that like, looks like a beta, and an equity risk premium. Each carries its own weight. And let's see what the weight is. Your risk-free rate reflects a currency in which you do your valuation. Doesn't reflect the country, doesn't reflect risk, it's just a currency. Value a Russian company in US dollars, the US dollar risk-free rate, the T-bond rate is my risk-free rate. So that carries your currency choice. Your beta reflects the business or businesses you're in. So if you choose to enter a risky business, that's where it's going to show up. And if you choose to borrow money, it's also going to show up in the beta. So the beta is going to reflect both your business choice and your level choice. And your equity risk premium reflects where in the world you choose to operate. So you choose to operate in the riskiest part of the world. Now, each number carries its own weight. And when people get sloppy and they let each number carry multiple weights, you end up double counting risk. I remember an Indian analyst tried to get his cost of equity past me and he said, no, can you look at my cost of equity? And he started the government bond rate in India. And I said, you know what? That's not a risk rate. He said, I'm just being conservative. It's an Indian company. I let him go with that. Then he got to the equity risk premium and he used a big equity risk premium. And he said, well, I'm just being conservative. It's an Indian company. I'm bringing the higher risk premium. Already you've double counted, right? Your, your government bond rate had a 2% default spread embedded in it. So you counted that as part of your base. And on top of that, you're building a bigger risk premium. He wasn't quite done. He got to the beta and he bought into my bottom up beta, but he said, I took your average beta for, I think it was a steel company, and I pushed it up by 20%. I said, why? He said, it's an Indian company. He said, how many times are you going to punish this company for being an Indian company? Risk-free rate is not a risk-free rate. You added 2%. Your risk premium is higher. Your beta is higher. I'm sure when he does his earnings and cash flows, you know what he's going to do, right? He's going to haircut them. Why? Because it's an Indian company. Mm. Then he wonders why no Indian company ever passes muster as cheap. I'm not saying you shouldn't adjust for risk, but keep it in one place. The beta is meant to capture business risk. The equity risk premium is meant to capture geographical risk. So if you're a Nigerian oil company, your beta doesn't look strange. Your equity risk premium will reflect the fact that you're in Nigeria. Any questions on cost of equity and the three ingredients that go in? So now let's talk about how else question. you can do it. Yeah, go ahead. So in one portion of the, goodness, there's a reverberation. In one portion of the calculation for, I believe, equity risk premium, it requires uh, the uh, implied equity risk premium for stocks in the market. I think like the S&P, if you're doing That's the US. Okay. The mature markets, yeah. Is that readily available, that implied equity risk premium, or is that something we have to calculate ourselves for the S&P? Did you get the, the spreadsheet that I sent you with the premium at the start of February? So Probably. Check it out because you can do it yourself. This isn't rocket science, right? You can get the S&P 500 as well as I can get the S&P 500. You can update the T-bond rate just like you can. I do it at the start of every month. So if you really don't want to do it yourself, I'll do it for you. But you know, how long can I, you know, that this, at some point, if you can do it yourself, you created a mechanism that you can then disagree with me about growth. Make it your own calculation. This isn't, you know, nothing you're doing is stochastic calculus. So take that spreadsheet. You can use my premium for the start of February, 2022, 
I'll be doing it on March 1st, but do it yourself simultaneously. Make sure we get the same number if we're using the same inputs. And if we don't, ask yourself what inputs am I changing? So the base is an implied premium. It uses all public information. Nothing I use is private information. I tell you exactly the sources I use. So there's no reason why you can't compute an implied premium. You know, today if you want, or the weekend if you want. So it's, it's something worth trying out. So now let's talk about the cost of debt. I'll tell you what the cost of debt is support. Did I answer that question on implied yeah, premium? Thanks. Let's talk about the cost of debt. I'll tell you what the cost of debt is supposed to measure. And then we'll look about how we get that. The cost of debt is a rate at which I can borrow money long-term today. Two keywords there, long-term. You know why I put that long term in there? Because if I tell you what your cost of debt is based on what you borrow at, if term structures are put slower, which is short term rates are lower than long term rates, one way in which companies try to make their cost of capital look lower is they say, look, I borrowed six month loans, a one year loan, the rate is lower. No, no game playing. You want to do one year loans, that's your choice, but I'm going to attach a long term cost of debt to it because that loan has to get rolled over. So long term cost. Today, it's the other word, which means that your cost of debt if you're a US company went up by about 0.3% between two weeks ago and right now. Why? Because the T-bond rate is up about 0.3%. The risk-free rate changes. Your cost of debt is it's like a it's like being in a you know on a lake and the and the, the level of the lake goes up, everything gets pushed up with it. So it's a rate at which you can borrow money today, which means you use today's risk-free rate and the spread you're going to have to pay over that. You say, how do we come up with the spread? As long as banks have been around, this is a challenge for them, right? When they lend money to somebody, they can't lend to you at the risk-free rate. They'll go bankrupt sooner or later. They take the risk-free rate, they add a credit spread. So tell me intuitively, you know, in common sense terms, what are some of the things, if you're a banker and I'm a potential borrower, what are some of the things you will look at to make a judgment on how much of a spread to charge? Yeah. I'm, I'm my what? My credit, but tell me what, I, remember, if I'm an individual borrower, it's not like I have a rating, right? If it's a company, you can cheat. So you're going to look at, do you think you might look at my age? Why? Because we know younger people, are, I mean, I know it sounds terribly ageist, but younger people are more likely to default than older people. They look at your age, they look at the part of the country you live in, they look at your part credit, past credit history, and there you could find some very toxic action. You might have declared bankruptcy three years ago. Credit risk is not some, you know, just pull the numbers together, have a score. You could come up with a score, but eventually they're bringing together all of this evidence saying, what is the chance that this borrower will not pay me back? Banks have always had to do it. And it's a lot of work, right? So they tried to simplify the process. In the case of companies and businesses, they try to simplify it by looking at ratios. What's your debt ratio? How much do you, you know, what's your interest expense? So interest coverage. So these are ratios. Again, they're looking at the capacity to borrow. In fact, uh, Ed Altman, who's been teaching here for a long time, takes these ratios and converts them into what's called a Z-score. Again, sounds fancy, but he's saying, let's take these six ratios and convert them into a number that will tell me whether somebody will default. And if you're a company of some size, sometimes banks outsource the assessment of creditors. You know what I'm talking about? Many companies, if you are in a hurry to lend, if you're a bond, let's say buy bonds, you don't have the, 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 the capacity to assess this credit risk or you don't have the patience. So what do you rely on? Credit score. Well, how do I take a credit score? If I'm borrowing, it's a credit score might not help me, but- or By credit scores, I mean like credit ratings. Credit ratings. Credit scores are numbers. Yeah. Credit ratings are alphabetic. You go from AAA to D, and they have a long history. For 100 years, Moody's and S&P and Fitch have been attaching ratings to companies. And much, much as people critique them for being slow to the process, which they aren't delayed, on average, they get them right. Because if you look at those tables of AAA rated bonds versus B versus C, there is a history of hey, those ratings predict the fall risk. And all of them are just intermediate steps to get a default spread. So when I look at lending to a company, I can do my own research based on ratios and say, I'll charge you 3% more. Or I can trust the ratings agency that says you're a triple B rated company and say, you know what, typically triple B rated companies, we charge two and a half percent more. That becomes your default spread. 
about 90% of companies around the world don't have credit ratings. Which means you and I, when we value these companies, have to come up with a default spread for these companies without the crutch. And when many analysts, when they see a company without a rating, throw up their hands and say, there's no rating, I'm just gonna make up a number. I'll use the book interest rate. Don't do that. Because what do we say banks used to come up with the spreads and ratings agencies also do? They look at ratios, right? Ratios based on public information. In fact, you look at the S&P website, they list out the eight ratios that they use to assess rates. Fixed charge ratio, interest coverage ratio. So about 30 years ago, when I started thinking about this process, I said, look, I'd like to be my own ratings agency. I'm going to create what I call a synthetic rating, which is if I were a ratings agency, what rating would I give you? The advantage of having a rating is it spreads are out there. I can go look it up in the market. So I took those eight ratios S&P had, and I did some reverse engineering. Let me explain. S&P has ratings for about 1,500 companies. They tell you the eight ratios they claim to look at to come up with these ratings. I created a big spreadsheet where in the first column, I had the rating for every company. In the next eight columns, I had the ratios S&P claimed to use. And then did an Excel sort of AAA all the way down to C of all the companies who rated. And then I started looking for patterns. Of course, you're not eyeballing the data. You're looking at you know, And here's what I found. For non-financial service companies, remember they claim to use eight ratios? They're lying. It's actually one ratio carrying the weight. The remaining seven are along for the right. They're all correlated. The ratio that seemed to have the most explanatory power explaining ratings was a ratio called the interest coverage ratio. You know what the interest coverage ratio is? You take the operating income for a company and divide by interest expense. Before we look at the ratio, if you're a lender to a company, you want that ratio to be a high number or a low number? You want it to be as high as possible, right? You want the company to make as much income. Right? You want the coverage ratio to be 15 or 20. So one ratio seemed to be caring. So I created a process for computing ratings. It's very simplistic. Remember, I'm not a fixed income guy. I don't want to get the rating precisely. I just want to get a rough sense of rating. I built it around the interest coverage ratio. So as an example, if you look at... Uh, uh, at Embraer, its interest coverage ratio between 2001 and 2003 was 3.56. Now, if I said, you know, would you lend to a company with an interest coverage ratio of 3.56? You're saying, I don't know. Is that a high number? Is that a low number? So here's what I did. I got the 1,500 companies. I got the ratings coverage, interest coverage ratios for every one of them. And I created a lookup table, which means based on how companies were rated, you tell me your interest coverage rate, I'll guess what your rating is. Here's what the lookup table looked like in 2004. You're saying, why the two sets of numbers? Because it looks like ratings agencies have two sets of rules. For small companies, you need to have a much higher interest coverage ratio to get a AAA rating than for larger companies. Life's not fair. It's the way it is. So I said, okay, you tell me whether you're a small company or a large company. So that'll tell me which day. Then you tell me your interest coverage ratio. So let's say your interest coverage ratio is 3.56 and you're a large company. Your rating is going to be A minus based on how S&P was rating companies in 2004. It's a very simplistic approach. I'm taking a ratio I can compute for any company using this table to look up the rating you're going to have. And I'm going to call it synthetic because it's not an S&P rating, but it looks like one. And the advantage, once I've got a rating, is the default spreads for every rating are available because there are traded bonds out there with that rating. And in, and in 2004, that default spread for uh, you know, A minus rating would have been 1%. I'm home free. I add that default spread to the risk free rate. I've got my cost today. Yes. Uh, just a quick question. How do you define whether a company is big or small? Is it by That's market? Basically, it's based on market cap because that's what the, but that's a good question. It could be based on revenues. It's a, but remember, none of these questions are finance theory questions, right? How do you answer the question? You go look at what ratings agencies do. This is, I'm not even saying the interest. I mean, I've had people push back, so why are you using interest coverage ratio? Why not the EBITDA to fixed charges ratio? I said, look, 
I'm completely agnostic. I'll take the weight of the CEO and divide by the height of the you know, of, of a secretary and come up with the ratio of that's what ratings agencies use. Because I'm not trying to be sensible here. I'm trying to be a ratings agency. I'm not saying ratings agencies are not sensible, but I'm just trying to replicate what they do. But that the size is based on market cap. Five billion or larger is large because you know to be really large in market cap to get, to get this special treatment. So now let's see how this plays out for the cost of debt to employer. Based on its rating, the default spread is 1%. So I would add it to the risk free rate, right? And I was doing Embraer's cost of capital in US dollar terms. So I take the T bond rate, I'd add 1%. So if this were boring, I'd be done. But if it's Embraer, I have a problem. And here's the problem it's a Brazilian company. You're saying, so what? This isn't fair again. When you're a company from an emerging market, you carry two burdens on your shoulder. When you're going to borrow money, the, borrow, the bank looks at you and says, okay, how safe are you as a company? And they come up with a rate. And then you say, oh, by the way, I'm a Greek company. The bank says, that'll be 5% more. You think that's not fair? Hey, life's not fair. In this case, your cost of debt, if you're from an emerging market, will be higher than the cost of debt of a developed market company simply because you carry that burden of country risk on your shoulder. So the way this is going to show up is when I ca calculate the cost of debt for Embraer, uh, Embraer I start with the T-bond rate, which is the risk-free rate in US dollars. I add the 1% default spread, which is the default spread we came up with based on the synthetic rating. But then I look at the Brazilian default spread. And you know what? For most companies, I just add the whole spread. But with Embraer, I'm actually adding only a portion of the spread for the same reason my Lambda is 0.27. They get a big chunk of their revenues outside Brazil. And there are some Brazilian companies that actually have gotten to a point where they were able to borrow money at a rate lower than the Brazilian government in dollar terms. But for most companies, you got to think about how much of the country default spread you're going to carry, and it's going to get embedded into your cost of debt. So my cost of debt for Embraer in US dollar terms is 9.29%. If I'm doing this in Brazilian RIA terms, of course, I'd have started with the RIA risk-free rate and the country default spread in RIA is for Brazil. But the process here is I have two default spreads, a company and a country. And you can skip the country default spread if you're looking at a triple A a company in a triple A rated country, the US or Europe. But in emerging markets, that's not going to get embedded in your cost of debt. If Embraer had an actual rating, I would not have to add the country default spread. You know why? Because ratings agencies actually, when they rate companies, incorporate where the company is located. For the longest time, in fact, they used to have a country ceiling for a company that no company in a country could ever have a rating higher than the country it was in. You could be the safest company in all of Venezuela, but guess what, you're screwed. They've removed the rating ceiling because some companies like Petrobras and Embraer can, can at least escape a little through it, but it still says that when you look at the ratings of companies in a sector, the emerging market company in the sector will have a lower rating, even though the numbers look pretty much the same. That's a country that's showing up on the cost of that. So if you're doing a synthetic rating, you have to do the work of adding the country risk. If the ratings agency has a rating for your company, you just got lucky. That rating already incorporates country risk. You, do, you can skip the country default spread part. Now I've used these synthetic rating tables now for 30 years. I use them in the US, I use them in Europe, I use them in Asia. And you know what, I need to use them even more outside the US than in the US because outside the US, a lot more companies are not rated. It's, it's getting better, but there used to be a point in time where almost no company in Asia had a rating. And I'll give you the warning of you taking this table because this table was developed primarily with US companies. Not because I was being you know, narrow-minded, but what did I use to get this table? I looked at companies with actual ratings. And when I did this in the 90s, out of the 1,500 companies, 13, 1,380 or 1,400 of the companies were US companies. I've developed a table based on US companies. And I, the reason you gotta be a little wary is those numbers reflect the level of risk free rates in the US and how it plays out in interest rates. Let's say you enter a market where the risk free rate is 15%, Turkey. 
Uh, demand, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. If you demand an 8.5 interest coverage ratio, 8.5 interest coverage ratio, you get a AAA rating. No Turkish company would ever have that. Because when, when the risk-free rate is 50, remember everything gets pushed up. The interest expenses get pushed up. So when you're in a part of the world where risk-free rates are much higher, this table will tend to underrate companies. You see why? Because I'm demanding you get US level interest coverage ratio. So that might be really difficult to do because of the level of risk free rates. You can tweak the table to reflect that, but that's something to keep in mind. If you're looking at a company in an emerging market with a very high risk free rate and you're using this table to get a synthetic rating, you might be attaching too high a cost of debt for the company because you, you're setting it up against a standard that's not quite fair. Any questions on synthetic ratings? Incidentally, the ratings agencies now offer this little spreadsheet where you enter in five numbers and it gives you a rating. I think they charge you like $500 per rating. Don't waste your money on them. Okay. Because what they do is they take the five ratios, they do a score like the Z score and they have a lookup table just like mine. If you really want to bring in four more ratios, you can, if you, you know, it's not a big deal. The numbers are there. And I, since I'm going to be nagging on multiple things, how many of you have checked out Capital IQ? Okay. If you haven't, please do. It's an amazing database, you know, and you can compute the interest coverage ratio for every company in the world in five minutes. It's just basically the data is there. You put it into an Excel spreadsheet. You don't have to pay s and to do this for you. This, this isn't rocket science. You're just trying to assess default risk based on financial ratios. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Find a rating or coverage ratio. Do we still use your lookup table? If, for, I'm sorry? If we are able to find a rating online. No, just use the rating. Then because, you know, unless you really, really don't like the ratings agencies. No, you, you decide they're just useless. Then you can use my synthetic ratings. But let's face it, they do use more information than I do, right? They have more than one ratio. They talk to the companies. They have the history of the company. I would hope that there's more in their rating than what I can get from an interest coverage ratio. But I'll also tell you that I can replicate about 60 to 65% of the ratings of all companies using an interest coverage ratio approach. So I'm not sure what you're gaining with all these millions of dollars that are spent on coming up with ratings because the marginal information in them seems to be relatively small. But if it's there, might as well use it. Yeah. Yes. If an investment bank has a client from an emerging market, and they, let's say they managed to get that at a lower interest rate than the risk-free rate of the country. How can you justify that? Why, why do you even need to bring an investment bank into this picture, right? Just like, so let's take the investment bank out because that makes it sound like the investment bank has some special skills. But let's say you have an emerging market company, a Petrobras or a Embraer, which is able to enter markets, issue bonds at a rate lower than the government. Yeah. Yeah. What you've effectively then done is taken that, see the default spread adjustment? That can't be lower than zero, right? So what happens then is the default spread for the company is actually lower than the default spread for the government. It can happen. In fact, it happened with Petrobras 15 years ago when Petrobras was a nice safe company and Brazil was getting into trouble. It doesn't affect your calculation because basically what it means, you have the T-bond, the right? That's still the risk-free rate in US dollar terms. The default spread for your company is still the default spread, but that, that sum is going to be lower than what the government can borrow at because your default spread as a company is lower than the default spread for the country. So can it happen? Yes. And I'll tell you what the kinds of companies will happen. Usually big companies that get the bulk of their revenues outside the country. Now, that sounds familiar. That's the Lambda thing that we talked about with equity. If you're an oil company, you sell everything into a global oil market, you might be much more credit worthy in dollar terms than lending to a government, in the country that you're in. So it can happen. Yeah. Another Somebody question. at Zoom had a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so in the bottom of the slide, it says the cost of debt is equal to you know risk-free rate times two-thirds. What is the two-thirds? Well, the two-thirds is like a lambda in the bond market, right? I mean, the way I got it was I looked at about five big Brazilian companies, which all had foreign revenues. Like if that two-thirds is tough to get, you can use the same calculation used for lambda. You can put that in there as the substitute for the two-thirds. So just a measure of how exposed is this company. To country default risk. Your time, the substitute was what? Yeah, I don't know what's going on. 
Let's go to the country risk. It's like the lambda calculation in your cost of equity. Yes, okay. Sorry, that's not me. Yeah. Hey guys, mute yourself now because I'm getting all kinds of feedback now. Okay, I have no idea. So any questions on synthetic ratings and getting a cost of debt? So don't forget the end game here. Risk-free rate plus default spread gives you a pre-tax cost of debt. Now, the key number here is if I have a rating, can I get a default spread? Absolutely. Can those default spreads change over time? Absolutely, for the same reasons that equity risk premiums change over time. Just to give you an example, remember in 2008 in that crisis, how much equity risk premiums went up and down? Here's the default spreads during 2008. They started the year, so let's take a, a, an investment grade rating, triple B. Started the year at 2.02%. So let's say you're a triple B rated company. At the start of 2008, when I compute your cost of debt, I add 2.02% to the risk free rate. November of 2008, you're still a triple B rated company. I'm not lowered your rating. The default spread has now gone to 5%. The same reason the equity risk premium changes, the default spread will change. It won't change this much in a typical year. This was a crisis year. And if you look in 2020, you saw the exact same phenomenon play out. So I update default spreads once a year usually. But in 2020, for instance, I updated four times during the year. Why? Because the numbers kept changing so much. So usually you can get away using the, the I updated last January 1st, 2022. Hopefully, all of you will be able to use those default spreads for your project. You know, you know what I mean by hopefully. Unless a crisis hits in the next three weeks or four weeks, in which case everything is back to the cleaners. You've got to come up with new default spreads. It's not difficult to look them up. I'll give you a source of how you can update default spreads. Again, my objective is not to be a, feed you a spreadsheet, but to feed you a way of doing the spreadsheet yourself. But default spreads can change over time, which means your cost of debt will change over time. I told you about 2020. Remember how equity risk premiums in February and March of 2020 when COVID hit and the economy shut down? So it's sort. Same thing here. When you look at rate, you know, let's take triple B rated bonds. Start of, 20, start of the crisis on February 14, the default spread on a triple B rated bond was 1.33%. March 20th, six weeks later, it had almost tripled. Scary thought, your cost of capital as a company, nothing about you has changed, right? Your same beta, same rating. You're gonna have a very different cost of capital on March 20th than on February 14th. Now, uh, when, when you talk to companies and you ask them what their hurdle rates are, which is their internal cost of capital. Many companies will give you a number, 12%. Ask them how long it's been 12%. You know what the answer in most companies is? Forever, we never change it. How do you do this? How do you run a business with a hurdle rate that's stuck from 1988 or 1995? So if, you, if any of you get a chance to read that blog post on cost of capital in global companies now, I would strongly recommend it because the median cost of cap for a global company in US dollar terms now is about 6.33%. Global company, 6.33%. Using a 12% cost of capital, I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen in your business. You're going to find nothing. No project is going to pass muster. Why? Because you're charging a cost of capital twice what the market is building in as a price. This is the road to ruin is if you end up with a 12% cost of capital in a market that's pricing things at a six. You said, I'd like to make a 12. Oh, yeah, me too. I'd like to fly as well, but I don't have wings. You can't go around setting hurdle rates based on what you'd like to make, but reflect what you need to make. So update default spreads and make sure in fact that you're building in a cost that you fix. Couple of final loose ends on cost of debt. Once in a while, you might have access to subsidized debt. 
you know, green energy companies in the U.S. early on used to get subsidized debt. Tesla, you know, early on got this subsidized loan from the government. It paid it off quick, a you know, long time ago. But this is not uncommon. Embraer, for instance, is viewed as a Brazilian crown jewel. It's a manufacturing company. It's a global company. It used to be a Brazilian government company. Let's assume that the Brazilian government lends money to Embraer at a 6% rate in US dollar terms. Remember 9.2 something percent was what we came up with as our you know, fair cost debt. So the government lends at a subsidized rate. I'm gonna ask you a very practical, pragmatic question. You've got a computer cost to cap for Embraer. What cost of debt should I use in coming up with the cost of capital? And I'll give you the choices. You can use the subsidized cost because they're, it's, a, it's a current cost of borrowing, it's a subsidized. You can use a fair cost, which in this case would be 9.25% by adding up the risk-free rate and the default spreads. Or maybe there's a solution that's creative enough because both those choices come with consequences, right? What's the problem of using a 6% cost of debt in your cost of capital? Your cost of capital will be lower, which is good, which reflects current reality. But if you then use that as your cost of capital forever, what if you effectively assume that the government will keep doing subsidizing you forever, right? That's pretty dangerous because then if the subsidy leaves, you're kind of stuck with this, what the heck have I done? So you don't want to use 6% forever. You don't want to go to 9.25% as well because then you're missing the benefit from the subsidy entirely. So there are two ways you can split the difference. One is, remember your cost of capital can change over time. So if you want to start this game with a 6% subsidized cost, and look at how it changes over time. And over time, you remember by the time you get to the terminal value, it might be 10 years out. You want to move to 9.25%. That way you get the benefits of the subsidy, but you also let it roll off at some point in time. One thing I always suggest to companies is actually say, use the 9.25%, get a cost of capital with a higher cost, and then look at how much the subsidy is benefiting. It's very simple, right? You're getting a 3.25% lower interest rate. I can calculate the value of the subsidy. Let's say it's $150 million. That's the value of the subsidy. Saying, what? why do that? Do governments ever do something for nothing? When the government does something for you, there's always something else down the pipe, right? I'll give you an example. And um, I valued a sugar company in India. In India, sugar prices uh, you know, uh, if you look at sugar companies, the, the government gives you all these benefits. So they have all these benefits that show up. But it does, in return for the benefits, require these companies to shell, sell sugar to a portion of the population at below cost. That's part of the quid quo pro. So when I went to the company, they wanted to build a subsidy to the cost of capital. I said, okay, I'll build the subsidies. But have you ever stopped and asked the question whether the value that you're getting from the subsidies is actually less than the value you're giving up because of what you're required to do because you get the subsidies? It's worth asking, right? Even if the benefit is greater, you might want at some point say, this is not worth it. Part of the reason Tesla paid off its debt way before it was due, it, was real, it realized very quickly that this was becoming more a burden than a benefit because now everybody looked at Tesla, the reason they're doing well, even though it is really not, there's no way it could have got to be a $100 billion company just because of the subsidized loan, but it became an easy excuse for short sellers. Without the subsidized loan, Tesla would never make it. So Elon Musk said, you know what? This isn't worth it for me. And the last thing I want to do is end up being beholden to the federal government who now feel that because they've given me a subsidy, they can tell me where to make my cars and you know, how much to do. It's, Every subsidy has a consequence. And your job in valuation is to look at both the benefits and the cost, because you almost never get an unalloyed benefit where the subsidy just helps you and nothing else happens because of it. Yep. Uh, I, yeah. So you got a cost of equity, you've got the cost of debt. One final point, the cost of debt you have is a pre-tax cost, right? There's a tax benefit to borrow. And how do we show that? We take a pre-tax cost and then multiply by one minus the tax rate. Two questions. When you look at a company's financials, do they report a tax rate? And if so, what's the tax rate you see reported in company financials? Let me help you along. It's called an effective tax rate. 
What's an effective tax rate? You go to the income statement for a company, you see taxes. So this is an accrual income statement. You see taxes paid and taxable income. The effective tax rate is just the taxes paid divided by taxable income. How many of you do your own taxes? I use TurboTax. It takes me a few hours. And when I'm done, TurboTax tries to piss me off. He says, congratulations. You're done with your taxes. This year, you'd paid 18.93% of your adjusted gross income as taxes. You know what TurboTax does? It takes the taxes I'm paying, divides by my taxable income. It's doing an effective tax rate. The average effective tax rate for US companies is about 18 to 20%. So that's an effective tax rate. That's not the tax rate you should be using when you do cost of debt. The cost of debt should be computed using a marginal tax rate. You're saying, what the heck is a marginal tax rate? It's a tax rate I pay on the last dollar of my income. And if you're a corporation in the US, what's that tax rate going to look like on your US income? What's the number from which I'm going to build off? I'm going to start with federal taxes. Right now, that tax rate is 21%. Then you have state and local taxes. If you're in California, you're in Delaware, you're in New York, that number is going to be another five or 6%. The marginal tax rate for a US company is about 25 to 27%. And let me explain why that's the tax rate you should use when you're looking at the cost, the tax benefits from debt. Let's say you do your taxes. You have a million dollars in income. If I'm insulting, you add an extra zero. Let's say you have $100,000 in interest expenses. Tell me how this works. A million dollars in income, you're allowed to deduct interest expenses, you report $900,000 in taxable income, right? Think of where you saved on tax. It was not in the first 100,000, it was not in the middle 100,000, it was the last 100,000. It's a marginal tax rate that drives your cost of debt. And that's the number you need to be looking for. So you got the cost of equity, you got this after tax cost of debt. The last number you need are weights for debt and equity. I'll give you the choices. You can use book value weights or market value weights. What are book value weights? You go to the balance sheet, there's a shareholder's equity number in every balance sheet. That's the accountant's estimate of equity and a debt on the balance sheet. In every corporate finance and valuation textbook, you look at those weights. It's a no brainer. It's always market value weights. Find me a textbook in valuation that says book value weights and I'll burn the book right now, right? It shouldn't be written. It's market value weights. Are any of you working on your CFA or planning to do your CFA? Nobody? Yeah. Well, you know, you can still work on your CFA. And at least, I've had at least a dozen undergrads get started. So you graduate and you want to go for a CFA. It's, it's widely sought after certification. now. I don't have a CFA. I have no desire to get a CFA. I don't want to think about getting a CFA. But I've given the keynote for the AIMR, which is the parent organization for the CFAs. And I beg them every year. Please let me write the exam for the CFA this year. Because if you have ever seen a CFA exam, it's like an endurance test. It's like make you read 7,500 pages and ask you what was on page 2,863. Oh, you don't know it? You fail the test. Why? Because they got to fail about 70% of the people to make the CFA a kind of lucrative certification. So I said, let me write the test because this is testing people on memorization, on brute force. And if I had my brothers, I'm going to write a CFA exam, the question I would ask would be one question. You answer this question, you get all three levels of the CFA. If you don't, yeah. you ready? This is your chance to get an unofficial CFA. Okay, don't do anything crazy with this. You know, you could get sued, you could get in trouble. Put CFA demodorant if you want next to it. So kind of, you know, separate yourself. DFA, uh, DFA that's fine. Huh? So here's the question. Every textbook, tells you to use market value weights to compute cost of capital rather than book value weights. Why? What's the reason? I'll, I'll give you, is it because the market is usually right? I'll give you the, the potential choice. Is it because the market is usually right? What's wrong with picking that answer? Let's say you say it's because the market is usually right. That's why I'm using market value weights. Use it to get a cost of capital. What do you use the cost of capital to do? 
value the company, then you come up with a value of equity that's different from the market price, and you tell me the company is undervalued, you're going to be hoisted on your own petard because you started this process by telling the market is usually right. How come you are the special one that found the one mistake? It's not because the market is usually right. Is it because market values are easy to get? Relative to what, book values? <clears throat> book values just as easily. Is it because book values are meaningless because accountants come up with them? I'd love to give this answer because I don't think much of accounting. It's, it's you know, it's, uh, it, that's not true. Book values are not meaningless. They might be outdated. They might not be quite correct. So you think, what the heck is the answer? Every discounted cash flow valuation you do is an exercise in an acquisition valuation where you're acting like you're going to buy the entire company. I know that's not your plan. You're buying a thousand shares, but you're acting like you're going to buy the company today by going out and buy, you know, buying all of its equity and buying all. So when you go out to acquire all the equity in a company, let's say you want to go decide to go acquire Tesla. Can you offer book value of equity? For you? you can, but nobody's going to sell their shares to you. Book value of equity is like 30 billion. Market value is 900 billion. So first you have to pay the market value, whether it's right or not, that's what you have to pay. You can retire all of the existing debt, but guess what? You got to issue debt that has equivalent market value. Market value is used because that's what will cost you to buy the company today. It could be totally wrong, but you have no choice. That's why we use market value rules. So if I bring those all together for Embraer, here's what the numbers look like. My cost of equity. So this slide actually brings together everything from the last hundred slides. My risk-free rate is the US dollar risk-free rate. Why? Because I chose to value Embraer in US dollars. It's a choice. 4.29% is risk free. For the beta, I used to beta 1.07. Remember where that came from? Earlier today, I did the bottom up beta for Embraer. I looked at global aerospace companies and the gross debt to equity ratio. So it's a bottom up levered beta 1.07. The equity risk premium of 4% was the implied equity risk premium for the US in 2004. The lambda of 0.27 came from running that regression, if you remember in the last session, of Embraer stock price against the Brazilian country bond, trying to get a measure of how it's supposed to be country risk. 7.89% was my country risk premium for Embraer in 2004, default spread scaled up. My cost of equity in dollar terms is 10.7%. Market value of equity is easy. It's publicly traded, multiplied as shares. And remember, we have multiple class of shares. Take them all. You can't just take the voting shares and non-voting shares. They're all part of market cap. So this is a number you can pull up from Yahoo Finance, market cap, there's it. So I've got my equity numbers. To get my cost of debt, I start with the same risk-free rate. The base is the same, but I had two default spreads. One is for the Brazilian government, lower than the actual spread for the government, but because that's because Embraer evades at least some of the risk. And the second is the default spread for Embraer as a company from their synthetic rate. Pre-tax cost of debt of 9.29%. The marginal tax rate in Brazil in 2004 was 34%. Incidentally, if you go to my website, I have marginal tax rates by country for pretty much every country. I would love to tell you that I did the research to do it, but I didn't. I stole it from KPMG. I did do it every year. I tell them I st I'm stealing it from you. you know, if, you want, if you don't want me to, just let me know. So if you want to know the marginal tax rates for Nigeria, for Brazil, these come right from the tax codes. 34% is the marginal tax rate. There's one final small piece. Getting the market value of equity is easy, right? Share price and number of shares. Getting the market value of debt is a bit of a pain. Why is that? What form, especially you go outside the US? What? Yeah. So private loans aren't traded. Yeah, most companies, you look at where their debt is, at least a portion of their debt is not traded. They might issue corporate bonds, but they also have bank loans, and there's no market price. And because of this, you know what the practice in investment banking has become when it comes to debt because it's tough to get a market price. Any of you worked in an investment bank over the summer? No? They use book value of debt as a proxy for the market value of debt. Most of the time, it's not that diabolical, not dangerous. But once in a while, it'll get you into trouble. So I'm gonna give you a very quick and dirty way of converting book debt to market debt. And it goes back to the start of the class test. Embraer has 
1.953 billion in book debt. That's what the balance sheet showed. In the income statement, they gave me the interest expenses on this debt, 222 million. So think of that like the coupon payment on the debt. I've estimated the cost of debt for Embraer based on today's risk-free rate and default spread at 9.29%. So I'm gonna value it as if it's a gigantic bond. 222 million every year for four years. Why four years? Because the maturity of Embraer's debt on average is about four years. So I take the present value of the coupons. And at the end of the fourth year, I'm gonna get the face value, the book value. I discount that back four years at the 9.25%. And what I get as a present value, 2.083 billion, is my estimated market value. You see what this means? If your book interest rate is roughly equal to the market interest rate, your book value of debt, market value of debt are gonna be roughly the same. If your book interest rate is much higher than the market interest rate of debt, you're gonna end up with a market value higher than the book value. But as in this case, the book value, book interest rate is lower than the market interest rate, I'm gonna discount your debt. It's a quick and dirty way of converting book debt into market debt without any of the debt being traded. The bottom line is you bring those numbers together. My cost of capital per Embraer is 9.97%. Incidentally, if I'd been using the net debt ratio, this is where the weights would have been more than 100% for equity and less than 0% for debt. And that's why I said the end game here is the cost of capital. And that's not going to change that much. So let's say you do this for your company. You have an emerging market company. And you start the valuation deciding you're going to do everything in dollars. Six weeks into the semester, you decide that you'd rather do the valuation in the local currency. Sounds like a lot of work to go back and do it from scratch, right? I'm going to give you a quick and dirty way of converting a cost of capital in one currency into another one. There are two ways you can do it. One is the long way. Start with the risk-free rate, default spread, build up from a different risk-free rate. That risk-free rate would have to be the, not the government bond rate, but the government bond rate cleaned up for whatever it is. But here's an easier way to convert a dollar cost of capital into a nominal real cost of capital. We've kind of talked about this before when we talked about risk-free rates, but let's make it explicit. What causes risk-free rates to vary across currencies? Differences in inflation, right? If the inflation rate in Brazil is 8%, and the inflation rate in US dollars is 2%, I can take the US dollar cost of capital, 9.97%. And if I'm in a hurry, I can just add the 6%. That gives me 15.97%. But if I want to do this right, I take one plus the US dollar cost of capital, scale it up for the higher inflation in Brazil, and I can end up with a nominal REI cost of capital of 16.44%. Get used to doing this because this is an incredibly good tool to have in your arsenal. Because let's face it, no matter where you go to work in the world, you're going to be dealing with clients who think in different currencies. So you go to work in Hong Kong, Hey, who knows? Your next client might be Vietnamese. He thinks, no, that client thinks in terms of Vietnamese dong. And you say, no, I can't do things. I can do things only in Hong Kong dollars. You're kind of stuck. This allows you to move across currencies by bringing in the differential inflation. Last point on cost of capital. In my cost of capital so far, I've thought about two ways of raising money, right? Debt or equity. You might have a company that's a pain in the neck. I'll tell you what pain of the neck companies do. They don't use debt or equity, they use mixes. These are called hybrids. I'll give you the most common hybrids. One is convertible debt. You know how convertible debt works? It looks like debt, but you have the right to convert it into equity. So convertible debt has two components to it. It's got a debt part, but then it's got an equity option because you can convert into equity. So that's one. And that's going to be an easier one to deal with because here's what I'm going to deal with, do with convertible debt. I'm going to break it up into its debt and equity parts and I'll give you a very simple way of doing it and put them into the two buckets. But the really painful way of raising capital, at least from my perspective in terms of calculation, is preferred stock. I'm talking about preferred stock the way it's used in the US. It's the way it's used in Latin America. Actually, it's really common stock with different voting rights. But in the US, preferred stock looks a lot like debt. It comes with a fixed dividend. Remember, equity doesn't. So you're saying, why can't I include it with debt? There's one catch with preferred stock. Does anybody know what it is? 
It looks a lot like that, but from the company's perspective, what do you not get on preferred stock that you get on debt? Voting rights. Well, you never get voting rights with debt in the first place, right? Preferred stock and debt have no voting rights. But with debt, what did I say you got after you borrowed money? The government steps in and gives you a tax yeah. advantage. Preferred stock does not have a tax benefit. Which raises an interesting question. Why the heck would you ever use preferred stock? Because it seems like a really expensive way of raising capital. You're either really stupid, which you can't rule out, or you're in a sector where the preferred stock actually lets you meet some other requirement. You know who the biggest users of preferred stock in the US are? What sector? <coughs> banks. You know why banks like to use preferred stock? because it's counted as tier one equity, because banks, when they, when they raise equity, that counts towards tier one capital, regulatory capital. When they borrow money, it's counted as non-regulatory capital. So if you borrow money, that makes you look riskier. So what do banks do? They borrow money, but they borrow it in the form of preferred stock. There's a huge consequence to them, right? They lose the tax benefit on it, but now it looks like you're having your cake and eating it too. You're borrowing money and your regulatory capital goes up. The regulatory guys like you. What companies do is not always driven by what's best for the cost of capital. This is definitely not good for the cost of capital. But companies do it because it lets them meet some other, some other constraint. So let's see how you decompose a convertible bond. Okay? So let's say your company open it up. I'll give you a very simple way of breaking a convertible bond into a bond and equity portion. Remember the equity portion is an option. So one way you can do it is to try to value the option. Option pricing is such a messy convoluted thing to do. So here's what I'm going to do, which is much easier. I'm going to value the bond part of it. And the question I'm asking is if this convertible bond were a straight bond, but there's no conversion option attached to it, how much would I pay for it? Once I get that number, whatever I pay in excess of it has to be for the option. So here's an example. You're a company which has $125 million in face value of convertible debt with a coupon rate of 4%. So it's on the books, 4%. But if this company went out and borrowed money today, they'd have to pay 8%. You're saying, why would anybody buy a convertible bond with the coupon rate is low? Because you get that option. So I took the convertible bond, took the coupons and the face value and discounted back at the 8% rate I would demand if it were just a straight bond. What I get as a present value is 91.45 million. So if this bond had no conversion option in it, I'd pay 91.45 million. The bond was actually trading at 140 million. It's market price. You subtract out the 91.45 million. That difference is my conversion option. So here's what happened. So 48.55 million, I put into equity. The 91.45 million I put into debt. My convertible bond has now disappeared. I no longer have to worry about it. I can move on. So what do I do with preferred stock? Here's what I try to do. I cover one eye and I act like I don't see it. And if it's preferred stock, which is three, four or 5% of the capital, just let it go. Act like it's not even there. Just take the debt and the equity. If it's 20, 30, 40%, you have no choice but to open a third bucket in your cost of capital. You'll have equity, cost of equity, debt, cost of debt, preferred stock, cost of preferred stock, usually the preferred dividend yield with no tax benefits. That becomes your composite cost of capital. Don't make your life complex. Don't slice and dice debt down. I've seen people compute cost of capital. They take now, equity, you know, cost of equity times weight of equity, then they have short term debt times weight of short term debt, medium term debt times weight of medium term debt, long term debt times weight of long term debt, floating rate. This is asking for trouble. Just take all of the debt, give it one cost, and move on. Because if you slice and dice that debt, you could be spending days on something not worth spending time on. So let's bring it all together. Cost of equity came from the risk free rate, the bait, and the risk premium. The cost to debt reflects the rate at which you can borrow money today, which if you're rated, you can use the rating to get the default spread. But if you're not, you got to build up to with the synthetic rate. With debt, you get a tax benefit. Make sure that tax benefit is a reflects a marginal tax rate. We'll come back and talk more about effective and marginal tax rates in the next class. The weights are going to be market value weights. 
The end game is you're now computing a cost of funding the entire business, not just the equity, not just the debt. This is going to be the discount rate you use when you discount cash flows to the entire business. Any questions about cost of debt, cost of preferred stock, cost of convertible debt? So if you can, get rid of those hybrids. Bring them all into debt or equity. Have only two items in your cost of capital. Your life will be much simpler. Okay, so we're going to end there, and I will see you online Wednesday. Remember that, on Zoom on Wednesday, but back in class the following Monday.